And now our New Testament reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Listen now, friends, for the word of the Lord. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I hope that you have all had a blessed and wonderful Thanksgiving. I know that I did, and... Um, I am, I, I was grateful to have a week off. I was grateful for Ashley to be here to speak with you all. I heard wonderful things about this, and I'm looking forward to, to watching the video of her, uh, of her uh, talk with you last week. Um, you may have been uh, great, equally grateful that you didn't have to hear my voice for a week. I uh, was grateful for family. I was grateful for each of you and for this congregation, the opportunity to be a part of what God is doing in this place. Thanksgiving is, for a great many of us, a time to reflect, and it was for me. And I was grateful for those happy things that I mentioned, but I found myself also being a little bit grateful for some of the tough times that I have been through in my life. Now, you might be wondering why in the world I would be grateful for tough times. Well, it's easier, one, to be grateful for, for tough times when you have made yourself kind of through them, right? And you can look back and say, there were moments when I really wasn't sure, but God was there all along. Some people think that ministers, clergy types, are immune to moments of grief or doubt or that shadow, that, that valley of the shadow of death. But that's not true. We, we wake up in the middle of the night and wonder what's going on in the world. We go into meetings already in a cold sweat or tough conversations wondering how it will turn out. We have those moments too where we just pray, pray, and pray and hope that God is listening. Friend, if you're in one of those moments now, God is there. And when you get through to the other side, you will see that has been true all along. And so it's uh, with that gratitude that I approach Paul's letter to the Philippians today. And as we enter into Advent and we've been talking about peace, peacemaking in this place for the last month or so. And we've been talking about how our peace that we have in Jesus Christ is meant to be shared, though not meant to be given away, that we have to, we have to guard it. As Paul says, we have to focus on the good things of God to remain in that peace, to hold that peace within us, or the things of the world will take it from us. 
We also have talked about how to make peace in the world. We have to have some inner peace within us, some inner strength that comes not from our strength, but from the Lord's. Now, I do want to be clear, though. When we're talking about having inner peace, we are not necessarily talking about being at peace with the world as the world is. There are a great many things in the world which we know we shouldn't be at peace about. We shouldn't be at peace with injustice or oppression or hatred or ugly ungodliness, sorry, or selfishness or wickedness. I was thinking about this this week, and yes, there are times when you're prepping for a sermon and you feel a little bit like that boy staring at the book a moment ago. I was imagining that a Bible and, and that being me looking down at it. But as I was thinking about it this week, what are the things in the world that we're not supposed to be at peace about, right? And the man in black came to mind. Johnny Cash. I wear the black for the poor and the beaten down, living in the hopeless, hungry side of town. I wear it for the prisoner who has long paid for his crime, but is there because he's a victim of the times. I wear the black for those who never read or listened to the words that Jesus said. Even while we struggle to find peace and hold on to that peace that we know Christ gives us, we know we can't be at peace with much of what we see in the world around us. So, we're called to respond. To respond to the world with love and to respond with the darkness we see in the world by showing Christ's light. How do we do that? Again, through the inner peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Again, not, not a peace, not being at peace with the world, but having a peace that comes from the one who came into the world to reconcile the world to himself, Jesus Christ. And that, to me, friends, is what Advent is about. We are waiting on the Prince of Peace to arrive. Again, we are waiting for the Prince of Peace, even as we hold on to the peace that Jesus has already once given us. And Spangler reminds us that Jesus is called, in fact, the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom in Hebrew, Prince of Peace. And though Jesus spoke of bringing a sword to the world, remember He said, I come to bring not peace but a sword. That's, that's because of how the world will react to His message of peace, friends. But He said He also brought shalom to all who embraced the Gospel. And she, she points out some examples of that in the Gospel. We see the woman bleeding for 12 years. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace to be freed from your suffering. He said to the woman who washed his feet with tears, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. To the disciple who doubted, he said, peace be with you. Stop doubting and believe. To his disciples before his death, he said, my peace I give you. And then after his resurrection, he came back into the room. Remember, he broke into the upper room and he said, peace be with you. He breathed His breath into them. Friends, I'm convinced that as we experience that inner peace of Jesus Christ, we come to recognize more and more in our lives, in the world around us, that needs God's redeeming light and love. But at the same time, we have to hold on to that peace, that assurance that God will be with us even when we walk through those valleys. As a, a friend of mine said not too long ago, having peace makes us aware of a need, a greater need for justice in the world. But as we seek justice, if we don't hold on to our peace, we run the danger of turning into that 
which we're trying to overcome. Real justice comes from a deep sense of inner peace. Just as there cannot truly be peace in the world without real justice. Justice, justice flows from peace. It flows from people being at peace and being willing to work for what is right. So does solidarity. So does speaking the truth in love. Peaceful protest, for instance. We've seen examples of this in our history and around the world. We, we see how beautiful it is, how inspiring when we can turn enemies into friends, when we can invite others to join into what we believe God is speaking to us comes from a place of peace. So many of the heroes of our faith, and you may have uh, one hero in the faith, and I may have a different hero of the faith, but so many of our heroes in the faith, whether we go back to the times of the Bible and look at Peter and Paul who acted with conviction, but also from a deep place of peace. Peter and Paul, who would both say, would both stand up and affirm to the early church, no, the gospel of Jesus is for everyone. Peter and Paul, who would also both be willing to die for their faith, had a rich, deep sense of the peace of Christ. More recent people of God who we've seen in the last century, for instance, people like Billy Graham or Martin Luther King Jr. or Mother Teresa, who, who exhibited the light and love of God in very different ways, right? But also acted with a deep, deep sense of peace. An inner peace that Christ gave them that some might say enabled them to change the course of history, but I would say it's that deep peace in them that became known to others and grew to influence those around them when they saw what God was doing in and through them and their hearts and their lives. Spangler would say it this way, Whenever our problems seem big and God seems small, we lose our peace. The opposite might also be true. If we hold on to our peace, we can remember that God is big. And our problems, no matter how big they may seem, are small. You may know this story. I was struck by it when I read it several years ago and, and, and have remembered it ever since that uh, that Dr. King, I mentioned him a moment ago, that in the time of the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, and he found himself at the forefront of a, of a burgeoning movement, one that he really didn't want to be at the forefront of. He wanted to be a pastor. He wanted a quieter life. He didn't want to be a figurehead of a movement. But he found himself there, and he was receiving death threats. It was after one such threat in the middle of the night that he sat at his kitchen table and he prayed to God. And he said, Lord, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And he says, and I quote, it seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice. Do you hear that? What Dr. King said is a quiet assurance what I hear is an inner peace. He said, I knew that God would be with me. I knew that God would be with me. In seeking justice and truth. We find ourselves in that now and not yet of being the church, in between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming, and we await the Christ to come again, Jesus to come again, and, and make everything the way that we know it's supposed to be. Isaiah talked about this. Isaiah talked about Jesus as much as any prophet in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 2 that, that Jeff read for us a moment ago, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, 
Neither shall they learn war anymore. It ends, did you hear this? Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Who's the light of the Lord? John tells us, right? The light of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. Where can we know that peace will come from? From Christ, the Prince of Peace. He came once, and we know the story. So many of us know the story from the Gospels. The world wasn't ready for the kind of peace that He brought, that He offered. Are we? Are we ready to receive that peace that changes us in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds? Are we ready for that? One of the things Isaiah says is they shall beat their swords into plowshares. It's a wonderful image of taking the weapons of war and turning them into instruments of life, giving, and peace. Pastor, a uh, friend of mine who's uh, also the artist in residence at Austin Seminary, C.D. Weaver, told me a story recently about how uh, he began uh, doing uh, religious art, Christian art. And he started, actually, by melting down uh, objects and turning them into crosses. And they would, they would give these crosses to um, young folks, particularly when they were baptized in his church. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? Melting down things of the world and turning them into crosses, symbols of the peace and hope of Jesus Christ. Well, he, he told the story about he was sitting at his desk one day, and, and a man came in, and it was, it was, it was a man he knew. He was kind of a, 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 a gruff man. He had, he had served in World War II, and, and in fact, he came in and set down his navigator's wings on the table and said, I want you to turn this into crosses. See, he said, well, I can't, I can't do that. You, you earned those wings. I can't. I can't do that. And he said, no, you didn't hear me. I want you to turn this into crosses. Some time later, C.D., this pastor, was at a gathering, and he ran into a little girl who said, do you recognize me? Not, not a little girl, I'm sorry. He ran into a young woman who said, do you recognize me? And he realized he did. And she showed him her cross that she'd been carrying around all that time. That symbol of hope, of peace in her heart from what Christ has done for her. She'd been carrying all that time, made maybe, maybe from those very wings. Friends, peace is coming. The Bible promises that peace is coming. There will be a day. We don't know when it will be. I hope it's soon, don't you? It sure seems like it's a long way away sometimes. But the Bible says it is coming. Whenever that will be, know this. You can have a foretaste of that peace. Now, not peace with the world the way it is, but peace with God. Peace within yourself that can help you face whatever the world brings. Peace with brother and sister in this place. Do we have it? Yes, we do. Friends, even now, the Prince of Peace comes. Even now, as a child. Are we ready? Amen.